Hello and welcome to Astronomy with Mr. Gerin. Today we're going to look up into the sky and answer that tricky question, where is everything? By the end of this video you will be able to do all the maths needed to locate objects in the sky as required for Edexcel's Astronomy GCSE. A professional astronomer will use more complex maths but for the GCSE we can simplify it a bit. We'll start with locations on the Earth. You've probably come across latitude and longitude before two numbers that define any location on Earth's surface. Latitude is how far north or south you are. We need a starting point and the obvious choice is the equator. North of the equator is positive, for example plus 30 degrees, while south is negative, for example minus 20 degrees. Zero degrees means exactly on the equator. Latitude goes up to plus 90 degrees at the North Pole and minus 90 degrees at the South Pole. But if we say plus 30 degrees, that's anywhere on a circle, a line all the way around the Earth. So we need to say where we are on that line, and for this we use longitude. We decided to use Greenwich in London for the zero mark, and said east is positive and west is negative. For example, plus 50 degrees means 50 degrees east of Greenwich, and minus 130 degrees means 130 degrees west of Greenwich. Longitude goes up to plus 180 degrees and minus 180 degrees. You can use positive and negative or compass degrees, but you should be able to switch between them. We've talked about degrees so far, but one degree is a big distance. I could say that I'm at 48 degrees north, 2 degrees east, but that could be anywhere in Paris, so we need to be more precise. We can use decimals if I say I'm at 48.8530 degrees north, 2.3498 degrees east, I'm in Notre Dame Cathedral. But astronomers prefer to divide degrees into sixtieths. This dates from the ancient Babylonians who used the base 60 counting system. One sixtieth of a degree is called an arc minute. The symbol is a single quote mark. The arc minute is then itself divided into 60 arc seconds. The symbol is the double quote mark. In this notation, Notre Dame is at 48 degrees, 51 arc minutes, 11 arc seconds north, 2 degrees, 20 arc minutes, 59 arc seconds east. You should be able to convert decimal angles into degrees, arc minutes and arc seconds, and vice versa. There are two examples on the screen. Pause the video now to try them out, and then I'll show you the answers. Example 1. 15.8 degrees is 15 degrees plus 0.8 degrees. Since 1 degree is 60 arc minutes, 0.8 degrees is 0.8 times 60 arc minutes, or 48 arc minutes. Add that to the 15 degrees and we get 15 degrees and 48 arc minutes. Example 2. We need to convert the 24 arc minutes into a decimal. Since 60 arc minutes is 1 degree, 24 arc minutes is 1 degree times 24 sixtieths, or 0.4 degrees. Add that to the 32 degrees, and we get 32.4 degrees. Here is a map of the Earth. The lines of latitude and longitude are all parallel, and we can see squares of 15 degrees by 15 degrees. The 0 degree, 0 degree point is in the Atlantic Ocean, south of Accra in Ghana. Trouble is, that map's wrong. In fact, all flat maps are wrong, because the Earth isn't flat, and it's definitely not a rectangle. Different maps are better for some purposes, and worse for others, and this rectangular map shows latitude and longitude very clearly, so it's very useful in astronomy. Now, at last, it's time to look up. This is a map of the 300 brightest stars, and just like the Earth map, it's a rectangle. Just like the Earth map, it distorts the shape of the sky, but it's very useful to astronomers. We're now using celestial coordinates instead of geographical coordinates. They're similar, but with a few important differences. First, imagine lying down so that you're looking at the Earth, with your head to the north and your feet to the south. Up is north, down is south, left is west, and right is east. This is how maps of the Earth are drawn. Now, roll over so that you're looking at the sky. Up is still north and down is still south, 
but your left and right have been swapped, with left being east and right being west. This is how maps of the sky are drawn. We don't use latitude and longitude in sky maps. We replace latitude with something very similar called declination, or dec for short. Just like latitude is how far away we are from the equator, declination is how far a star is from the celestial equator. But we never use north or south, always plus or minus. Up to plus 90 degrees at the celestial north pole and minus 90 degrees at the celestial south pole. The celestial equator is the Earth's equator projected into space. Imagine standing on the equator and pointing directly up. You're pointing at one part of the celestial equator. Now wait in that position for 24 hours. As the Earth turns, your finger will trace out the entire celestial equator in the sky. Any star that you point to in that time is on the celestial equator. In other words, it has a declination of zero degrees. Now, what about longitude? For this, we use instead right ascension, or RA for short. We chose our zero point for longitude as Greenwich, and likewise we need to choose a zero point for right ascension. On the 21st of March, the vernal or spring equinox, the sun is exactly on the celestial equator, at zero degrees declination crossing from negative to positive declination. The location of the sun at this time called the first point of Aries, is our zero point for right ascension. We don't measure right ascension in degrees, but hours. Imagine that you point a telescope at a star with right ascension zero, and then wait an hour. Because the Earth spins, your telescope won't be pointing at the same place after that hour, so you'll see different stars, and these stars have a right ascension of one hour. Wait another hour, and you'll see objects with a right ascension of two hours, and so on. So we measure right ascension in hours, minutes, and seconds. But be careful, this is not the same as arc minutes and arc seconds, so don't get those two confused. Also, because of the direction the Earth spins, we measure right ascension from right to left. But sometimes we do use degrees. In this case, we don't call it right ascension, but sidereal hour angle, or SHA. This is measured from east to west, or left to right on the star map, from 0 degrees to 360 degrees. This is important, and you need to be able to convert between right ascension and sidereal hour angle. The formula is shown on screen, along with two examples. Pause the video now to try them out. Example 1. Right ascension is 360 minus our sidereal hour angle of 60, all divided by 15. That's 300 divided by 15, or 20 hours. Example 2. Sidereal hour angle is 360 minus our right ascension of 9 times 15. That's 360 minus 135, or 225 degrees. So, now that we can describe where we are on the Earth, and where a star is in the sky, we can talk about where stars appear in the sky from our location. This is where you would point your telescope, or your eyes. And we need another pair of coordinates, because the sky is always changing as we move about on the Earth's surface and as the Earth spins. We start by pointing our telescope due north at the horizon. First, we'll point our telescope upwards. But how far? Well, somewhere between 0 degrees, the horizon, to 90 degrees, directly above you. Directly above is what we call our zenith. How far up we point is called altitude, how high above the horizon a star appears. If the altitude of a star is negative, then you're out of luck, because there's a planet in the way. Next, you need to turn your telescope clockwise, or to the right. This is called azimuth. Zero degrees means north. Turn 90 degrees and you're looking east. 180 degrees is south. And 270 degrees is west. 360 degrees is north, or zero degrees, back where you started. We've discussed six numbers so far, 
and now I'm going to add time as a seventh number. You need to understand all of these. I'll show you some brief definitions shortly, but you should also make notes on them. You do need to understand them to follow this lesson. I recommend you finish watching all the way through once and then go back through making notes as you go. It's well worth taking the time as these are crucial concepts in astronomy. If you have five of these seven numbers, you can work out the other two. Usually, astronomers will know latitude, longitude, time, right ascension and declination and then calculate altitude and azimuth so that they know where to point their telescope. Navigators do the reverse. If they know the altitude and azimuth of a star, they can calculate their own longitude and latitude. This was very difficult in the past when clocks would fail on a ship that kept rocking and rolling. John Harrison created the H1 marine chronometer, which you can see on screen. This kept accurate time at sea, and he won a big cash prize for this and probably saved the lives of thousands of sailors. The full maths for the calculations involved are very complex and beyond GCSE level. We'll have a look at the simpler maths that you need shortly. Before we go any further, we need to understand three more concepts, meridian, zenith and culmination. A meridian is a circle all the way around the Earth or the sky. On Earth, a meridian is a line of equal longitude. In other words, a line across the Earth's surface from pole to pole. The meridian of longitude zero, which passes through Greenwich, is called the prime meridian. A meridian in the sky is any circle that passes through both celestial poles. Astronomers are most interested in their local meridian, which also passes through their zenith. The zenith is just the point in the sky directly above you. To trace your local meridian, point directly up to your zenith. Then, move your arm in a circle towards the south. Keep going. You'll point directly down, and then north, and finally up again. That circle is your local meridian. Now, as the Earth turns, stars seem to move through the sky, sometimes moving to a higher altitude, sometimes moving to a lower altitude. The star will reach its highest altitude when it crosses your local meridian, and that highest point is its culmination. I've introduced a lot of new terms and concepts so far. This is definitely the most keyword-heavy lesson in the Astronomy GCSE. I'm now showing you two screens summarising these new terms. This is a great time to pause the video and make notes on any of these that you don't yet fully understand. At the end of the video, I'm going to go through some GCSE style calculations. First though, I want to show you how the stars actually appear to move through our night sky. We look at four different stars from three different locations, 40 degrees north, the equator and the North Pole. All of these locations will be on the prime meridian and all observations take place on the night of the 21st of December, the winter solstice, because that gives us the longest northern night. Note that in the southern hemisphere our observations would be similar to the northern hemisphere observations, but in the northern hemisphere the stars rotate anti-clockwise about a point in the north, but in the southern hemisphere they rotate clockwise about a point in the south. I've used Stellarium to create these videos. This is free open source software and I highly recommend downloading it and trying it out for yourself. Just playing around with it is very educational. There's also a paid mobile version for a few pounds which tracks the stars as you point your phone at them. We'll start by watching Betelgeuse as it rises, culminates and then sets. But first Let's familiarise ourselves with what we can see. We're looking south. To our left is east, and to our right is west. The blue lines show right ascension and declination in the sky, and the light blue line is the celestial equator. Betelgeuse's declination is about plus 7 degrees, just above the celestial equator. The orange lines show altitude and azimuth. The green line is our local meridian, at azimuth 0 degrees and 180 degrees. Betelgeuse's right ascension and declination are shown in the top left, and these don't change. 
but just below is Betelgeuse's altitude and azimuth, which will change throughout the night. We can see Betelgeuse just rising in the very left, and let's watch it. It rises, moving slowly from east to west. As it does so, its altitude and azimuth both increase. After some time, it reaches our local meridian at azimuth 180 degrees. There you go. It culminates, meaning it's at its highest point in the sky. And after this, it starts to set. At culmination, Betelgeuse was at an altitude of 57 degrees. We can see this, but we can also calculate it. We'll use the equation altitude at culmination equals 90 degrees minus our latitude plus the declination of the star. So that's 90 degrees minus 40 degrees latitude plus 7 degrees declination. That's 57 degrees. You'll need to learn this equation. It isn't given to you in the exam. Now let's watch Betelgeuse again, but this time from the equator. It rises in the east, just like before, and gets higher in the sky until it culminates. And we'll use the same equation. Its altitude at culmination is 90 degrees minus our latitude of 0 degrees plus 7 degrees. That's 97 degrees. Well, that doesn't make sense. We know that altitude can't be greater than 90 degrees. So what's happened? Well, Betelgeuse has gone 7 degrees past 90 degrees. And we're looking south, but Betelgeuse is actually now in the north of the sky, 7 degrees below 90 degrees. Or in other words, around 83 degrees altitude, with an azimuth of due north, or 0 degrees. Now we'll let it carry on and set. Finally, we'll watch Betelgeuse from the North Pole. Altitude at culmination here is 90 degrees, minus our latitude of 90 degrees, plus 7 degrees. That's just 7 degrees. But at the North Pole, stars never change their altitude. They appear to spin around in circles at the same height, so Betelgeuse will always be 7 degrees above the horizon. Now we'll watch Sirius which has a declination of minus 17 degrees. We're back at 40 degrees north, and we see Sirius rise, and as it reaches our meridian, it culminates at an altitude of 90 degrees, minus our latitude, minus Sirius's declination. 90 degrees minus 40 degrees minus 17 degrees equals 33 degrees. And it continues to set in the west. Now it doesn't set exactly due west, but a little bit south as it has negative declination. Betelgeuse has positive declination, so it rose in the northeast and set in the northwest. How about on the equator? Sirius rises in the southeast, reaches a declination of 90 degrees minus 0 degrees minus 17 degrees equals 73 degrees, and then sets in the southwest. Compare that with Betelgeuse, which culminated at 97 degrees, so that we had to adjust our results to say 83 degrees in the opposite direction, north. And now from the North Pole. Oh, hang on, where's Sirius? Well, its altitude is 90 degrees minus 90 degrees minus 16 degrees, or just minus 16 degrees. That's below the horizon. If I remove the Earth, there it is. Stars with negative declination will never rise at the North Pole. We can calculate whether a star will ever rise from our current location. If its culmination has an altitude less than zero degrees, we'll never see it. Now we're going to watch a dim star called Delta Ceti. Delta Ceti has a declination of plus 0 0.3 degrees, almost exactly on the celestial equator. If positive declination means it rises in the northeast, and negative declination means it rises in the southeast, then Delta Ceti, with declination basically zero, 
will rise exactly in the east. We see it follow the path of the celestial equator, culminating at 90 degrees minus our latitude of 40 degrees plus its declination of 0 degrees. In other words, it reaches 50 degrees and then sets off to set exactly west of us. Moving to the equator, Delta Ceti again follows the celestial equator. I've zoomed out quite a lot for this one. Delta Ceti basically follows a straight line, rising in the east, passing directly overhead at altitude 90 degrees, and then sets in the west. And now at the North Pole. Remember that at the poles, stars never rise or set. At the poles, the celestial equator follows the horizon. So Delta Ceti just circles us, skimming the horizon. Note that we don't have east or west markings on here. We are at the North Pole, so every direction we can look is south. Our last star is Polaris. This is the pole star, at almost exactly 90 degrees declination. So from latitude 40 degrees, its altitude is 90 degrees, minus 40 degrees, plus 90 degrees, equals 140 degrees from south. That's more than 90 degrees. In fact, it's 50 degrees more. So we look north and we see it 50 degrees down from our zenith, or 40 degrees above the horizon. It doesn't move all night, which makes it excellent for navigation. From the equator, Polaris is at 90 degrees minus 0 degrees plus 90 degrees from due south. That's 180 degrees from south, or in other words, it's on the horizon to the north. Polaris isn't exactly at 90 degrees declination. It's about two-thirds of a degree off, so it does move in a very tiny circle. From the equator, if the land is flat with no trees or buildings in the way, we'll see it just rise and set a tiny bit. And finally, from the North Pole. Here, Polaris is at an altitude of 90 degrees, minus 90 degrees, plus 90 degrees. That's 90 degrees, exactly overhead at our zenith. Moving in a tiny little circle throughout the night. Now, we're going to do some calculations. These questions are taken from Edexcel's Astronomy GCSE Specimen Paper 1. This one's easier than it looks. Pause the video, give it a go, and unpause for the answer. Now, Polaris isn't exactly on the North Celestial Pole, but Edexcel assumes it is, to simplify things. Polaris has a declination of 90 degrees, and your latitude is 56 degrees, to the nearest degree. Here's the complicated way to answer the question. Polaris's altitude from the south is 90 degrees, minus your latitude of 56 degrees, plus Polaris' declination of 90 degrees. That gives you 124 degrees. But that's past 90 degrees, so it's in the north. We say that 180 degrees minus 124 degrees equals 56 degrees. Now here's the easier way. Polaris' altitude is just equal to your latitude, 56 degrees. The azimuth is even easier. The North Star is due north, at azimuth 0 degrees. For this one, you need more precision. Give your answer in degrees and arc minutes. Pause the video now. We're told that Vega is exactly due south. That means that it's on our meridian, at culmination. Now, at culmination, a star's altitude is 90 degrees minus our latitude plus the star's declination. That's 90 degrees minus 55 degrees and 57 arc minutes plus 38 degrees and 45 arc minutes. First, we'll calculate the degrees and the arc minutes separately. So 90 degrees minus 55 degrees plus 38 degrees equals 73 degrees. And 0 arc minutes minus 57 arc minutes plus 45 arc minutes equals negative 12 arc minutes. So Vega's altitude is 73 degrees 
minus 12 arc minutes. Remember, there are 60 arc minutes in a degree. So subtracting 12 arc minutes from 73 degrees leaves us with 72 degrees and 48 arc minutes. Now for these last questions, I need to introduce some new terms. We normally tell time based on the sun. Midday, or 12 o'clock, is when the sun culminates. But we move around the sun, so the sun culminates at different right ascensions throughout the year. In astronomy, we also need the time based on the stars, and this is called the sidereal time. Sidereal time is the right ascension on your meridian. As we just saw, Vega has a right ascension of 18 hours 30 minutes. So, when Vega culminates, or crosses your meridian, the sidereal time is 1830. We need to know local sidereal time, the sidereal time where you are, and Greenwich sidereal time, the sidereal time on the Greenwich meridian at zero degrees longitude. A sidereal day is 23 hours 56 minutes, four minutes less than a solar day. You can actually buy clocks that keep sidereal time, but most people don't use them since we've got computers. For question three, you won't need sidereal time, but you should know a very useful fact. For every one degree of longitude you travel, the local time changes by four minutes. If you go one degree west, the local time will be four minutes earlier, and if you go one degree east, the local time will be four minutes later. Pause the video now and give this one a go. The time difference between the ship and Greenwich is 2 hours 25 minutes, or 145 minutes. As discussed, 4 minutes of time difference is experienced for every 1 degree of longitude travelled. So the ship has travelled 145 divided by 4 equals 36.25 degrees or 36 degrees 15 arc minutes, if you prefer. That gives you two marks. You get the last mark for the direction the ship has travelled. Since ship time is earlier than Greenwich time, it must have gone west. Now technically we do need to add that to the ship's starting longitude, but that was on the Greenwich meridian, so we're just adding zero. Last question. Pause the video and give it a go. We want to find Greenwich sidereal time, but first we're going to need to find local sidereal time. Local sidereal time is the right ascension of the meridian, and we know that because Vega is on the meridian, since it's exactly due south, and Vega's right ascension is 18 hours 30 minutes. That means that local sidereal time is also 18 hours 30 minutes. Now we need the time difference between us and Greenwich. Our difference in longitude is 3 degrees 15 arc minutes, and each degree of longitude is 4 minutes of time. So 3 degrees and 15 arc minutes times 4 equals 13 minutes of time difference. Since we're west of Greenwich, then Greenwich is east of us. Eastern locations are later, so we add those 13 minutes. Our local sidereal time is 18 hours 30 minutes. We add 13 minutes to that, and Greenwich sidereal time is 18 hours 43 minutes. Now, these calculations are all quite simplified. At GCSE, we don't go into the really complex details. You just need practice, and I hope to post some more practice questions in the future. But before I go, I just want to show you Betelgeuse from different longitudes. We watched as it rose from different latitudes along the Greenwich meridian. Now, we're going to see it at different longitudes but all from 40 degrees north. Here we see Betelgeuse from the same location as earlier, 40 degrees north at longitude zero. It rises and culminates at the meridian. Betelgeuse has a right ascension of six hours, which means that when it culminates, the local sidereal time is six hours. But look at the solar time at the bottom of the screen. It's midnight. Let's try again from a location 15 degrees east. 15 degrees east means that local time is 4 times 15 equals 60 minutes or 1 hour later when Betelgeuse culminated at our original location. So here 
Beetlejuice culminates an hour earlier at 2300, 11 p.m. Now we'll go 60 degrees west of Greenwich into the Atlantic Ocean. Local time is 4 times 60 equals 240 minutes or 4 hours earlier. So Beetlejuice will culminate 4 hours later at 4 a.m. These three locations were all seen on the same day, 21st of December. Let's go back to longitude 0 degrees, but three months earlier on the 21st of September. This time, Beetlejuice culminates at 7 a.m., not midnight. Ah, but we're in British summertime, which is one hour ahead, so really it's 6 a.m. Because sidereal days aren't the same as solar days, they get out of sync with each other. We went back in time a quarter of a year, and Beetlejuice culminated a quarter of a day later. And that's it. I'll leave you with this map of all the visible stars in our sky. Thank you for watching. Goodbye, and have an excellent day.